The Parthenon is a Doric temple. That's its architectural style. And one of the things that defines a Doric temple is that it has triglyphs. And in between the triglyphs are metopes. <laughs> I love those words, <laughs> triglyphs and metopes. So triglyphs just means sort of a mark of three, and it's just little three lines. That kind of ridges. Mm-hmm, exactly. And in between, these squares with really deep relief carving. Mm-hmm. They're about five feet square. These would have been in a area right above where the capitals are. That's right, and below the pediment. And the metopes that we're looking at depict a battle between the Lapiths and the Centaurs. And I think we'd better talk about who they were and why they were fighting. This is a story that would have been a kind of mythic story even for the 5th century Greeks who are depicting them. And the story tells of a wedding, a Lapith wedding. Now the Lapiths were a tribe of ancient Greeks and they lived near the forest. Now in the forest were these creatures that were sort of only half human, these centaurs, half human, half horse. And the Greeks would have looked at them as kind of monstrous creatures. You know, for the Greeks, there was a whole hierarchy of kinds of beings. The gods at the top, then there were heroes, and heroes were the result of a union between a god and a human. And then, of course, there were humans themselves. And then below that, there were these subhumans or monsters, and the centaurs certainly were that. So they were not quite human, still part of the animal world, Mm -hmm. and not entirely to, to be trusted. Nevertheless, the Lapiths were feeling extremely extremely generous and really wanted to celebrate this wedding. And so they invited the centaurs to the wedding. That was a big mistake. It was a big mistake. They had a little too much to drink, didn't they? (laughs) They did, and they took advantage. In fact, what they did is all at once they began to abduct the Lapith women. So what's being depicted is the Lapith women being made off with and the Lapith males fighting with the centaurs, who are really quite formidable. Not only do they have six limbs, but, you know, they have all of the brute strength of a wild animal. The one we're looking at is of a lapith struggling against a centaur. It looks like he's grabbing him by the neck and pulling him. You can just see his fingers wrapping around behind that neck, mm-hmm. even though the neck and the, and the head itself are gone. The, he's pulling him back, though. Look at that. It's almost like he's a bow, a spring. You can feel the tension of that body as it's being pulled back and the strength of the centaur that's really trying to pull away and free himself. It looks actually like the center is holding on with his right hand onto something and struggling against being pulled by the lapis. Look at the kind of composition. It's so complicated. You have a couple of opposing arcs, the arc of the Lapith's body, and then the arc, of course, of the centaurs as well. Yeah, so it's almost a circular composition in a way. And look how deep that carving it's is. It's amazing. It's really deep. almost freestanding. It's actually remarkable to me that more of this did not break off than did because it's, it's in such high relief, it's almost freestanding. And marble is really soft stone. Mm-hmm. I also love the fact that those broad planes of the body are played against the more complex sort of backdrop of the cloth. I mean, this is in some ways incredibly naturalistic, so naturalistic that we almost believe... You don't notice the artifice. Well, not only the artifice of the perfectly draped cloth in the background, (laughs) but how about the artifice of the fact that we almost believe that a centaur could exist? In other words, that this is almost a believable union (laughs) of a human and a horse's body. That's true. What's really striking to me is the way our eye is drawn to the anatomical structure of the Lapith's body in the chest and the rib cage and the abdominal muscles and the pectoral muscles and those same structures in the body of the centaur. You can see its rib cage and veins and so there's a kind of mirroring of these figures. There is a kind of mirroring. I think that's exactly right. But there's also a kind of subtle distinction which is that the tension that the artist has constructed because of the bowing of the centaur's body Mm -hmm. is not seen in the exertion of the Lapith. In other words, look at the Lapith. Even though he's exerting tremendous power to pull back this horse this, the centaur. He's in control. He's in total control, total balance, and in fact the body is almost relaxed. Yeah. Yeah. Remains almost completely sort of perfectly noble and perfectly balanced even within yeah. this battle. Look at the difference in the way that the centaur and the lapith's heads, their faces are represented. First of all, you've got the, the sense of age difference, right? So you've got the beautiful noble face of the Greek, of the lapith. And even as his neck is being crushed, even as he's being choked, 
there is a sense of rest and nobility. There's not, no anguish in that face whatsoever. In contrast, we have this gnarled, bearded, long-haired, older figure with a kind of knit brow, a kind of wild, open eye, and with a kind of broken nose, all of which is looking rough and very much not the kind of noble mean that the Greeks give themselves. It's almost as though the human has superhuman strength and doesn't need to draw on the brute physicality that the centaur has to draw on. Well, I think the Greeks were making a real distinction. They were noble, and they were distinguishing themselves from the brutish barbarians beyond their borders. In fact, a lot of art historians look at this and say that the Lapiths are, in fact, the Greeks, of course, but the centaurs are those that are not Greek, and the Greeks themselves were looking towards, for instance, the Persians, their great enemy, with real fear as barbarians as kind of almost animals, as almost centaurs. Representing a kind of chaos. And in fact, this art really represents, through its balance, through its perfections, through this kind of idealism, that sense of control that was so important to the Greeks. It's no wonder that for so many hundreds of years after this, thousands of years, we've looked back to this moment as this sort of extraordinary and precious and rare moment, not only because it was a moment of of limited democracy, but of a first democracy, but it was a moment when the mind and the body were both cherished and seen as extraordinary and beautiful.